Welcome to another week's uh, Crisis Jam, and we've got an ongoing theme today related to peer powered, and I'm really excited about uh, bringing back Wendy Ty Green again from the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And Stephanie will be talking briefly with Jess Stolman Rainey at the beginning of this call. She's going to be a featured presentation uh, in coming weeks, coming from uh, Rocky Mountain Partners in uh, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so, Karen, let's go to the next slide and look, uh, Dr. Margie Balfour, she's here to chew bubblegum and bring us a crisis meme, and she's fresh out of bubblegum. So, uh, Dr. Balfour, last week was Pawn Stars. Tell us about uh, Aquaman on the Prowl here. Yeah, so this is um, just a reminder that we have less than a year to implement 988, and it's going to need something to connect to. So, um you know, like Aquaman, it's creeping up on us. And so, um, you know, everyone here on the call is preaching to the choir, but, um, you know, now's the time for states to start to look at using the federal funding and you know, changing the regulations to be able to have crisis facilities and things like that. Great stuff, Margie. And Margie, since Paul had the channel last week, so any additional comments on the, uh, this is the best we can do from last week? Well, that's kind of like, that's currently what we got. So um, we should be better than the Pawn Stars. Great, great. Uh, next slide. Thanks so much, Margie. Margie's keeping up though with the pressure of a weekly. Uh, uh, we're still stuck at 10 states with Medicaid representation uh, and we want to continue to grow that. So uh, if you're a Medicaid leader on the phone, uh, help us out with connecting us with a nearby adjacent state uh, uh, the Vicky Wachinos and Tom Betlocks and others. Uh, I know that Jamie Snyder, who is our, our director here in Arizona, she happens to be both the Commissioner of Behavioral Health and our state Medicaid director is now the uh, chair of the uh, National Association of Medicaid Directors. Uh, so let's let's see how we can grow that. But uh, uh, we're still uh, a little bit locked and we haven't quite broken through 300 yet on participation. I'm interested as we get out of these summer months. Uh, next slide, Ren. Uh, Karen's on PTO today. So thanks uh, for Ren for stepping in. Again, the all the content uh, is uh, on the Crisis Talk website from uh, the videos and the tools and quotes to the presentations uh, going back all the way to the beginning of the year. And, and we have this new feature now, the three little dots uh, in the lower right of each of these videos, you can get to the actual transcript of the chat and text that went on as well. Ren, next slide. Uh, for those of you who got the Sunday reminder, uh, appreciate your patience as we're working through this new, uh, Paul, you were on that Sunday crisis jam, weren't you? Uh, I was there. I was there. Uh, so I, today, I think we've got it uh, almost there. We've got uh, some feedback from some of you about improving the communication, the, the brief newsletter, and we're, and we're trying to attend to all of that. So uh, I think we're uh, ready for this next level. Uh, there are about 600 of you who are actively participating on a week-to-week -week basis, uh, about 300-ish who actually join in the call on any given week. So we're trying to reflect that with a platform that will be easier and friendlier to you. So again, we welcome feedback on that. Next slide. Uh, Stephanie, uh, again, with this theme of uh, peer powered uh, and crisis services this week, uh, we had some comments in the text chat a few weeks ago from Jess Dolman Rainey, which led mm -hmm. to an interview. Tell us about- uh, Yeah. Your yeah, it was fantastic. Um, she, she, first off, Jess Solman Rainey is the director of program development at Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners in Colorado. Um, and she shared that organizations often throw peers into roles that are more like behavioral health technicians because of a fundamental nationwide misunderstanding of what peers do and the function they serve. And she says that's why many crisis service providers find that they're struggling to retain their peer workforce. Um, and that really peer support is designed to be an alternative to clinical intervention, but it's often used as a supplement. Uh, in 2019, she led a statewide peer crisis workforce needs assessment in Colorado. Um, and if Jess, if you're on the line, if you could talk a little bit about what you discovered and a little bit about your hopes for 988 um, in terms of integrating peer support, ser peer support services uh, as in the role of peers as opposed to uh, supplementing or, or yeah. um, 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. oh you're on here. Um, okay. I am on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I am. Uh, I am really excited to talk about this. I think it's a really critical kind of timing for our discussions about the peer workforce and and really recognizing that historically, um, particularly in crisis fields, we have um, we have kind of fragilized our peer workforce and talked about them as if uh, their contributions are are really going to be when people are out of crisis or pre-crisis um, and are um, sort of focused around sometimes around compliance with the mental health system instead of as an alternative intervention because we know that um, for a lot of people, the things that we offer in the mental health field are not actually what they want or the pathways that work for them. And so that doesn't mean that we can't offer still um, the sort of traditional behavioral health uh, interventions, but that we can support more people if we're offering something bigger and broader and that the role of peers is to provide that, that different alternative service. Um, one of the things that we really found out is that the, the workforce was really unprepared or the workplaces were really unprepared to have peers on board. And so what a lot of what happened is um, people are having clinical supervisors um, giving them clinical advice and then uh, being concerned about peers not having that clinical background. So uh, peers end up doing a lot of things like screening or walking people to treatment or things like that instead of being able to do what, what peer support is designed to do and offer an alternative intervention. Uh, and because of that, uh, peers feel undervalued in their workplace and they're often underpaid in, in comparison with uh, people who are also offering critical services. And um, sometimes they get cast as sort of this money saving uh, strategy instead of um, being seen as a legitimate uh, crisis service that we can offer. You mentioned also with 988 that peers, uh, the language of including peer support specialists is happening a lot in terms of 988 legislation. However, there's little direction in terms of implementation or what that will look like. Yeah, yeah. The the direction has been very, very vague, and there's um there hasn't been a lot of national guidance in general about the use of peers in crisis work. There's some uh there, there's some guidance from SAMHSA, but it's pretty um it's pretty broad still. So when it comes to practically imp implementing peer support programming, that gets really complicated. Um, a decision that we made on our crisis line that I think has been really useful is that people as they call into the line are able to select whether they want to speak to a peer or a crisis worker before they talk to anyone so it's not that you're getting screened into crisis into peer support mm -hmm. um it's that you get to make a choice and i think that's a really critical sort of space for us to think about is how do we let people access peer support uh, as, as they choose to instead of having it be something where you have to go through a clinical intervention first in order to access it Terrific. Thanks, Steph. And thanks, Jess. And Jess, that statewide assessment you were talking about, we're going to hear more about that uh, in your featured presentation, I believe, in two weeks. Great. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And uh, Dr. Anita Everett, are you with us to give an update today? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Uh, good afternoon. Let's see, it's afternoon, morning for you. Uh, thank you very much. So we're uh, continuing to grow our team at SAMHSA. We have, I don't believe she's here today, but we've added uh, a communications uh, expert who comes to us, a very seasoned communications professional who comes to us on an extended detail uh, from the CDC. And so we, uh, at one point, we'll introduce her personally. Uh, again, I don't think she's here today. And other than that, we've been primarily focused on briefing our uh, up. Uh, basically because of the great interest in 988 and doing the federal component of support for 988. I'll turn at this point uh, over to the rest of our team to get other updates. Uh, Dr. Palmieri. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so just as um, Dr. Everett said, I uh, have been spending uh, a fair amount of time sort of internally with briefings and document preparation. Uh, we are very excited about expanding our capacity with respect to the 988 team um, with uh, communications expert, and then also some dedicated time to support project management. Uh, and we'll provide some additional updates uh, probably next week with more specific introductions on people joining, joining the team. Um, but it's really out of recognition that there's, you know, obviously so many moving pieces and a lot of work to be done. And particularly in communications, you know, there's a lot of need in the field for us to uh, be able to um, assert our leadership in terms of uh, framing messaging and communications around 988 implementation. Um, and then the only other piece that I would add is related to 
work that we're planning regarding convenings uh, and really trying to uh, work with our stakeholders, uh, including state partners uh, around uh, readiness for 988 implementation and really understanding what some of the gaps and challenges are there uh, and trying to provide guidance and support regarding funding um, uh, guidance and um, other implementation supports. I think that's it, Richard. Yeah, I'll just mention two things. One is that uh, SAMHSA has formally weighed in with the FCC in support of um, uh, texting to uh, 988. I think that, you know, there are a couple of key aspects uh, to that, but we think it's inevitable that people will text to 988. You know, we discovered that people were texting to the current 10 digit number, which was the impetus for us to you know, start a texting service, uh, which obviously will need to be e expanded if there is texting to, um, to, 98, to, uh, to 988. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. The other, uh, just an update, work continues with the uh, Depart US Department of Health and Human Services Behavioral Health Coordinating Committees, a subcommittee on suicide prevention, and uh, crisis care. We had our first meeting, our second meeting is coming up next week. And we are in the process of setting up three work groups, one on developing an HHS strategic plan for suicide prevention, a second one on uh, 988, and a third one on comprehensive community-based uh, uh, suicide uh, prevention. Um, you know, there are a number of opportunities with this. We have partners in this effort, including on the 988 uh, work group that we've not worked, or at least I have not worked uh, closely with uh, before, such as CMS is part of that work group. Also the HHS Office of Civil Rights, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Financial Resources um, and others. So. Um, you know, I think it's an uh, it's an excellent process moving forward that we're really hopeful can have a major impact. So that's what I have. Terrific, Richard and and John and Dr. Dr. Everett. So, uh, Dr. Everett, any any thoughts on this new communications person coming over from the CDC? What what percentage of their role might be related to promotion of nine eight eight? I know that question has come up directly in the chat text over the last several weeks. 100%. She's ours uh, for the foreseeable future. So we've, we've, we've got a lot of messaging. You know, as you know, it, there's so many different components to this. And whereas those of us who work in the area kind of see it as a series of linking of simple sorts of interventions, it's actually complex how you explain the whole thing. And so, um, so she's 100% ours for the foreseeable future. Right. And uh, perhaps this, if, if Tyson isn't on the call today, perhaps this coming week we could do a brief status update on the uh, set aside and its uh, uh, application to helping states uh, drive design and crisis forward. Sure, and there's some interesting ideas that are back and forth in the different budgets uh, with regards to the percent of set aside that might be available to us. I don't think Tyson's on this week, but yes, we can for sure do that. Terrific. And can, can you say just a little bit more about that percentage uh, that you were just referencing? Well, it's, it's this, we're in the first year of this first uh, grouping of it, and it's 5% now, but there's some debate about increasing that to 10%. Great. Terrific. Uh, so let's go to Dr. Hepburn and uh, a, an update from the states. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, thank you, Anita and team, John, Richard. Uh, it's pretty exciting what's going on. Uh, I do want to echo what Margie said that one year to 988. So obviously all the states are working on 988. But uh, in the same way that uh, they're working on post-COVID strategies, they're also right back in with COVID in uh, many parts of the country. And one of the things that's happening right now is that kids are starting to return to school. Uh, so the leaders in the states, behavioral health leaders are really trying to uh, reach out and give support uh, to parents, to teachers, to the kids, uh, trying to find the right balance uh, for kids returning to school, wearing masks, uh, offering virtual alternatives. So uh, 
the, the main thing I think that's going on right now around the country uh, is something that probably many of the people on the call are dealing with, and that is what's the safest place for our kids uh, right. during this difficult time. Uh, at second, uh, we at NASVID were working on finalizing the details for our annual meeting and our papers. And so I just wanted to share uh, with the people on the call that uh, the, our papers for 2021, the main theme is beyond beds before, during, and after COVID-19. All the papers address COVID-19, 988, trauma-informed practices, and the involvement of peers. Uh, some of the topics include disaster preparedness, suicide prevention. Uh, Dr. Gould is uh, the writer on that one, along with Allison Lake. Uh, the social determinants, health equity, housing, employment, uh, and uh, NRI has done that one. Uh, child and adolescent focus, Ken Rogers, Rural and Frontier, Kevin Martone, uh, technology, Stephen Felipe. So, uh, I think that the, the papers will be of interest and we'll make sure that we get them available uh, as soon as possible. So with that, back to you. Thank you, David. So Brian, how many, is this the fifth or sixth uh, cycle of Beyond Beds now? Yeah, so this is the fifth um, and uh, next year will be the sixth. So, so, so. <laughs> this means that uh, Najbet has now led the development of 50 papers uh, related to crisis care going back to 2017, 2018, when you first began to supercharge and prioritize this. So that's just, just terrific and uh, uh, really, really, really great work. Let's, let's loop back uh, to SAMHSA just for a moment. Uh, Etan uh, uh, Raskus, uh, it, it, you had a comment thought. Just, just one quick thing to add, and, and Brian, thanks for the great update, as always. Um, David, to your question around communications, I, I think we um, are hopefully going to have a much more concerted focus on this front over the coming weeks as the new detail from the CDC comes on board. And I think there is a very clear sense that given the size, scope, and enormity of what needs to be communicated over the next 12 months and beyond, uh, that having on board somebody who has, you know, decades of experience running these types of campaigns would be incredibly helpful. And so I think more to come on this front, but SAMHSA will certainly be uh, driving from a leadership standpoint, um, some of the communication, both in terms of its scope uh, and the plan for the next year to come. So I just want to want to flag that. I know there's been uh, a lot of great suggestions and some degree of confusion around how we talk and communicate around uh, 988 publicly, and, and I think that's hopefully something that we will have a lot more guidance on in the weeks and months to come. That's that's great, and, it, and again, it reminds me of that crisis meme that uh, that Margie was sharing at the beginning of Aquaman sneaking up on us. We haven't yet had a broad, large promotion or media uh, engagement around this of CNN or Washington Post, et cetera. We've had smaller ones. Uh, I know Richard was talking about the Telecom Association wanting to do a press release around the 95%. Did, did they do that or? Yeah, and I just, I, I wanna add in there. I believe they did release that, Richard, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think there's an important sensitivity here around planning for the communication that goes live next July and not getting ahead of the curve. Uh, most importantly, with the thought behind that being, you don't want to overwhelm a system that already has a ton of demand and strain on it. And so allowing appropriate time to get the resources in place for the lifeline to scale up appropriately to meet the influx of demand that we of expect, um, I think is really important. And so SAMHSA's broader guidance has consistently been um, you know, we are not going to launch large scale communications around 988 until we have reached a point where, you know, hopefully in, in July and beyond of next year, where the lifeline has added capacity to meet the incoming needs. And, and Ita, the, 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 again, the $24,000 question is, can we get the media to go with us on that strategy? Yeah. And, and, and so... Uh, so this is Richard again. So Eitan is correct. My understanding is that CTI did do their press release. It did not, um, you know, what we were looking at is whether it would get picked right. up by a lot of other media outlets and yeah. whether that would have an impact on call volume. 
it did not seem to get picked up by um, by many outlets and has not had an appreciable uh, effect on call volume. I'll just comment really quickly on one note in the chat, um, which uh, Matt Goldman kindly uh, referenced the uh, study that's now published, uh, the, the great work that Madeline Gould did studying the lifeline crisis chat service and, and, and showing um, some significant reductions over 50% um, in um, uh, suicide, of suicidal thoughts among people accessing the chat. Um, so the major challenge for us is to, ex is to expand you know, the chat and text capacity, um, as well as obviously uh, being ready for increasing phone capacity in uh, you know, when 988 uh, becomes available across the country. Terrific, Richard. Richard, our, our theme a couple of weeks ago was step by step ferociously. What, how many, what, what does this make in terms of the number of uh, study evaluation uh, projects that Maddie has done with, with SAMHSA on crisis? At one point you were keeping, I remember she would say, this is number seven, et cetera. Are you, are you even still keeping track? No, I mean, but she, you know, the, you know, I, I think of it in terms of, you know, some of the basic areas, you know, the effectiveness of the phone line, right. uh, which uh, she, which were the original 2007 studies and which she has, uh, she's in the process of working to replicate now, extending that to chat, the importance of follow-up. And then um, the, I think very relevant as well to 988 is the uh, um, effectiveness with imminent risk callers and being able to work with imminent risk callers on the line um, and reducing their risk without needing to send police or emergency rescue in, in a significant number of instances. You know, so there are really, those are, are a number of really important categories of work that, um, that Maddie has, has done. Richard, she might be great to have as a featured presenter for this crisis jam over the course of coming weeks. I, I, you know, I remember a time when we just didn't have a professional orientation or protocols around this. And some of the work that Maddie led, that the emergency intervention that Richard was just talking about, working with people at imminent risk, these uh, suicide risk assessment standards, et cetera, those have, have propagated worldwide now. Um, uh, so it, she'd, be, she'd be terrific. Thanks, uh, T7, yeah. for, for our Eton for bringing that up. And thanks, Richard, for, for continuing that. So let's, let's go to the uh, next section. Uh, today's quote. So just in keeping in, in theme with the peer presentations we've got today, uh, Dr. Mark Reagans, many of you may be aware of him from his leadership at the Villages in, in Orange County, just released a new book, A Rebellious Guide to Psychosis and other extraordinary experiences. If you've never visited the village, uh, I think it, it says a lot or has a lot to for us to learn about our engagement of crisis care, building on some of the principles that Jess uh, was referencing and Wendy will get to here in a moment. But uh, one of his key quotes from, uh, I just was uh, looking uh, uh, online in his Psychology Today interview from a, a few years ago, talks about these key uh, issues related to recovery of hope, empowerment, self-responsibility, and attaining meaningful roles. And that's not work that we do after the crisis is over. That integrates in with the crisis. Uh, the, people's hopes and dreams are critical to what's going on with them, even when they're uh, on their worst day. So uh, if you have not read or, or, or learned of Dr. Mark Reagan's, uh, uh, his new book is, 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 is look, looks to be just a terrific addition. Next slide. Uh, Sarah Corcoran from Guide Consulting, uh, the uh, movement in Congress uh, with this step one, it looks like, of two steps on infrastructure. Uh, uh, what's going on at the, at the federal level? Yeah, and, and thank you, David. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm having some internet issues, so apologies. Just want to make sure uh, everybody can hear me. Yes. yes, step one of two is complete. They did pass that bipartisan infrastructure framework on Tuesday. That's that bipartisan package um, focused mostly on uh, physical infrastructure, Amtrak, bridges, uh, you know, water, et cetera. 
uh, they immediately went into consideration of the budget resolution that was released on Monday. And that sets up that $3.5 trillion package that will have more of the human infrastructure pieces that we're tracking. Uh, they had a lovely votorama last night, which will be the first of two this, uh, this summer fall. Uh, I believe it ended at 3.30 or 4 sometime Eastern uh, in, in, in the morning. Uh, and it's basically this document that they were voting on is a first step in this forthcoming budget reconciliation package for that $3.5 trillion uh, human infrastructure piece. Uh, it's a loose framework of some non-binding re uh, recommendations for each committee to consider, as well as top line numbers that each committee has to work with for the priorities within their jurisdiction. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a loose framework document uh, and that they will work on filling in over the next month, month and a half at the committee level. Um, we expect that the House may actually come back potentially in the later part of August to vote on the budget resolution, but that is, remains to be seen. And this document uh, does outline a priority of health equity, which includes maternal, behavioral, and racial equity in health investments. Uh, so that likely will um, contain, besides that home and community-based services piece, some behavioral health, mental health pieces as well. Uh, and finally, on the Senate Finance Committee front, they did release a request for information uh, last week, late last week, on barriers to access to mental health. They're looking for input from their Senate members as well as they will be opening up uh, for public and stakeholder feedback uh, later this month. So this sets up their likely mental health, behavioral health package that they'll be working on in the Senate Finance Committee later this fall. Uh, so we've got a couple different bites at the apple, one through this 3.5 trillion fr uh, framework that they'll be working on over the next few months, as well as the Senate finance uh, specific package. So a lot happening in August, but you know, what, what do we expect? They always like to throw some curveballs and lots of great opportunities to get some things done. Wow. Terrific, uh, Sarah. We'll look forward to seeing the detail of that as it uh, uh, uh tries to get to the finish line. It looks like it, 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 it's well on its way. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Natalie from AFSP or, or any of the team from AFSP, any uh, update or, or additional comments of legislation you're tracking or priorities you'd like to share? Sure, hi everyone. Uh, last week, uh, Richard had asked me to give an update on the Stand Up Act. And so I wanted to share that the uh, Stand Up Act did pass out of the help committee um, last Monday, I believe. And it, I'm sorry, I lost my place on my page. Um, and that there was some language changing that instead of conditioning the project aware grants on the grantee having or creating a student suicide awareness and prevention program, it prioritizes grants that have um, already have them or provide a plan to create the policies. And I think that this bill along with the lifeline bill, um, our hope is that they'll each pass the Senate, but I know that, um, with suicide prevention month, that might be good timing um, and waiting to see um, what the Senate wants to do. I'm having some conversations later today to fill myself in on some next steps and then we'll be happy to continue to update the group. Terrific, thanks, Natalie. Uh, next next slide, Karen. So we're, we're gonna try a new uh, segment today. Uh, uh, Angela Kimball from NAMI and, and, and uh, Laura Evans from Vibrant. Vibrant has been, both of those organizations have been so gracious and generous in sharing uh, the work that they're doing. Uh, again, we see the state map, this one from Vibrant uh, around tracking, but now eight states which have passed legislation uh, that supports 988. And we've got uh, uh, typically Tom and Paul doing five seconds on the crisis calculator. So we're going to merge those into a new segment. As we get into a little bit of a pause, uh, we'll have some more movement on states and we'll give those updates as they come along. But next slide, Ren, uh, we're going to pull these into a single view. We're going to start going through those states. And this is my first cut at a draft prototype of looking at the states and look for your feedback on this. Uh, but let's start with, because we've got several elements on this. Uh, uh, we've got the, uh, the state legislation. We've got the crisis calculator. In blue, you'll see information coming in from that forecasting simulator. 
that Paul has been giving us updates on. And then we'll look to Rep Orwall. But uh, just to start, any comments, Laura, from you related to the uh, your tracking uh, as, as Vibrant has looked at Washington State passing uh, this legislation? Uh, just uh, if you want to set the table for a moment, Laura. Sure. Thanks, David. And uh, I just want to thank uh, SAMHSA and uh, Brian with Nashbit earlier for their comments as well. You know, I think communication is going to be really important as we socialize uh, 988 in the lifeline to many states, uh, state legislators who may not be familiar. So I think that's really important that we are moving together in lockstep to better serve people in crisis. Um, you know, as, as you saw on the map, there were no changes and we anticipate that there may not be some changes for a while given uh, the situation in New York, uh, but very grateful uh, for the states, the eight states that have passed legislation, um, including Washington and, and Representative Orwell for her leadership uh, in Washington, uh, Oregon being the most recent one. So, um, you know, again, many states are still uh, using this time to think through uh, what they may introduce for the upcoming session. Uh, again, we want to make sure that crisis centers are a part of those conversations, uh, but nothing new to report there. Great. A Angela, anything you want to uh, add? Uh, Angela may not be with us today. Paul Galdis, uh, so uh, we've, uh, we've tried to weave in a little bit of the uh, expectations of what it would take to fund the more significant services of mobile teams and crisis receiving chairs, et cetera. Um, uh, any comments on uh, this component of, the, of this new format? No, so the, the format really lets you project. And as you see, the calculator uh, estimates that there'll be 175,000 individuals that would benefit from a face-to-face -face crisis interaction and supports over the year. And uh, I think the fantastic work Representative Orwell, Jen Stuber, and others did to bring this legislation through to start funding a system is fantastic. And the only note I would make there is if you look at those projections you have at the bottom left of this slide, David, around mobile teams at 16.2 million and the crisis receiving center uh, funding, which, oops, it's missing me there, 125 million. Uh, that's actually the overall spend for all payers. And we should be clear about that as we get to page two of the calculator. Our projections are that mobile crisis would actually cost the state $6.2 million and $56.9 million to the crisis receiving centers, with the rest coming from federal match and other payers for those services. Right. Great, Paul. Super. And Rep. Orwall, thanks so much. I, I, I was developing this last night and I was like, this is way too late to be putting this together. But Rep. Orwall <laughs> just came straight through and gave me the information I needed. Thank you so much. And again, thanks for your leadership. But Reflections or comments? Yeah, no, thank you, David. And it was an incredible team, as you know. And I also want to mention Senator Dingra, uh, who was vital. And I cannot tell you how important the fee is. Uh, it is doing so much to prepare our state. You know, these dollars are going to double our three crisis lines, uh, their staffing. It's going to help us with the IT to have, you know, these kind of what we're calling hubs, which will be doing so much more than they do now. And it also is getting that rapid response up and running. I know we, I heard earlier the immediate risk. Well, for those calls that need a response, we need to make sure our system can do that. And what I think is so important about the fee, which was very difficult to pass, is that it needs to be universal. You know, when people call 988, they can't be getting a bill, right? They don't get a bill when they call 911. It needs to be a stable source and it needs to be reliable and we need to protect it. Uh, right. We put in non-supplant language, and we also are going to audit it because those dollars need to be really used around 988. But again, I just um, I know it's a heavy lift for these states, but um, this fee is such an important catalyst to the changes we need to make. Awesome. <laughs> Terrific work. And as states, uh, as, as those of you who are out there, especially those of you who already have legislation passed, if any of you want to outreach us and help us develop these slides and uh, give some comments. Uh, we'll be going state to state over the course of the next uh, two or three months as we uh, uh, starting with the states that have already passed legislation. So uh, again, outreach us if you would. Paul, did you have another comment? Yeah, David, I just wanted to mention, if you note the fee that's up in the top here, 24 cents on each line and working its way to 40, the revenue that's generated, if you look down below, is 17.9 million up to 45.7 million. It is significant. I know there's been a lot of talk on how you pursue this. You have brought significant revenue 
to advance crisis care and immediate access in the state of Washington. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I think sometimes we miss, oh, 24 cents a line, what's that gonna mean? Uh, that, that starts you out at $18 million and you're gonna get up to almost 46 million annually, which is amazing work. Yeah, and Rep Orwell, I, I, I should have gotten to this already, but uh, so the, the spreadsheet you sent me last night uh, uh, shows 24 and a half million going to the combination, mostly to the call center, but also some to the IT supports and coordination efforts. And then the Chris staffing, can you say just a bit, Chris is the smallest component of that, but I, 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 I didn't take the time last night to figure out, you had told me before, but I'm forgetting what Chris is. So that is our planning committee that really brings together um, our state agency or governor's office, um, people with lived experience, uh, our providers, and it really is going to look at the landscape of what we have in our system and what we need. And again, it allows us to go back next session and really, again, focus the fee on those next step areas. We started with the call centers, we need to look at the rapid response and then crisis stabilization. So that committee is really gonna be overseeing a lot of that work. Wonderful, and now, I, now that you say it, I see it. Chris, in that last under notable, it says the establishment of the crisis response improvement strategy committee, which is Chris, got it. Okay, super, terrific, terrific. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're not gonna take any time on this, but I would love, uh, so it's closing tomorrow, these, uh, we talked about TSUN and the SAMHSA set aside, and Mike Hogan's been making some great comments uh, in, the, uh, in the text chat about uh, the parallels to what happened with first episode psychosis set aside and its power in driving us forward. Here's another opportunity. Okay, we've had the set aside, we've had the tremendous grants from Vibrant uh, for planning, and now we've got these very significant mobile crisis uh, grants from uh, Medicaid. I'd love to just uh, hear if you're uh, applying for that, or if you didn't for some reason, I'd love for you, uh, for you state to drop in the text chat. We're going for it. We've already submitted. We didn't because of X. Uh, would love to, love to hear that. Next slide. So uh, we're on to our featured presentation, and this is actually the second time we've had someone come back. Uh, uh, John Franklin Sierra from LA County is our other two-time presenter, as they did tremendous work around coordination with law enforcement and mapping out future state and dispatch protocols, et cetera, color coding, et cetera. We brought them back to build on it. And the same thing, Wendy white Tigreen uh, with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities in Georgia uh, has been a mentor and uh, inspiration for us for decades. Uh, but she uh, was, has already given one presentation with us, but I was seeing a slide deck uh, uh, around uh, just terrific work that she's continuing to lead in this space and asked her to come back and provide uh, us a little bit more uh, detail on the uh, Georgia approach to this integration of peer support in the crisis continuum. So Wendy, uh, welcome. Thanks everyone, I'm glad to be back with you. Um, it has been more than six months since I presented the first time, so um, and we did a, a super high level overview, but we have a cadre of additional folks now um, who were not with us or who would wanna hear more detail or evolution. So David, thanks for um, responding. And you responded specifically to, to a body, an, an email response that I was um, talking about, really about peers across the continuum. And in this not being a 988 thing, it's 988, it's crisis services, and it's really community outpatient services where a lot of prevention and early intervention has to happen. But my title for today, Recovery Matters, right? I mean, recovery is the, is the cornerstone to all of this. So um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I was the original negotiator with federal Medicaid for the approval of peer supports in 1999. And so I may be the longest standing peer support ally. Um, I'm, I'm not a lived experience background, um, although we all are, right, as families, partners, friends, um, neighbors. I will say what I often craft myself as is a plumber. Um, I try to build all the plumbing infrastructure for all the goodness to flow. And today what I'm talking about is recovery kind of flowing through those pipelines. And so um, in Georgia, that's kind of how I've always framed this, policy, money, financing, um, all the bounds through which really recovery should flow. And speaking about it specifically today related to our body of work um, under this piece of crisis legislation. So next slide, please. 
So this is a slide I used when I did my first presentation. Um, at that point, I had three slides because <laughs> we were moving along super quick. But basically in Georgia, um, we use our certified peer specialist workforce as a complement in all of these services, which you see here. And, and I'm intentional about the word complement, um, really underscoring what Jess was sharing uh, philosophically and principally at the beginning of our crisis jam today, which was um, peers aren't um, a replacement for clinical practitioners. Um, they are not treatment providers. They have a unique gift and skill set to boost recovery. And we don't talk about it in Georgia being one alternative or the other. We really talk about the peer work and the recovery work emanating from the certified peer specialist being a complement to all of the other things we are also putting in place into system. So um, I, I talk about it in that way. So just note here, um, the body of crisis services that Georgia already has in play in our orange boxes, certified peer specialists work in all of these spaces. And we've been intentional about their role um, in these spaces. And uh, it's never perfect, but um, we continue to reinforce and uplift this recovery workforce. So next slide. So why do we do all this, right? There's multiple reasons. Um, no, no one singly drives us, right? But um, we have a workforce problem. We have a workforce problem. <laughs> we have a workforce problem. Uh, we are in dire straits in the behavioral health system. And it is a national concern right now. So, you know, I'm, I'm here representing Georgia today, but we all know that this is a national challenge. You see that um, we have whole county designations in the state of Georgia, if you remember your geography. Um, we have whole county designations where there's a behavioral health professional shortage area, um, and then uh, where part of the county is a shortage area, a very tiny right around the metro Atlanta area. And if you'll go to the next slide, um, this is, and this was an animated one, so you can just go ahead, I think, in advance. There's a couple of, of maps here. One more time. Thank you, Ren. So this is a problem that's getting worse for Georgia and not better. Um, so we've been invested in the peer workforce since 1999. This, the numbers of certified peer specialists that we are uh, certifying is not solving some of this challenge. We're not getting... Um, more social workers, more psychiatrists, more um, APRNs with a mental health um, specialization. We're not solving this. This is still a giant challenge and continues to be the trajectory. So um, the latest map from Georgia that's been published. Um, so we do have this workforce challenge. We've been talking off and on about peer specialists and certified health workers across the country assisting with this, but we have to be mindful of right role, right work. Um, specifically, I just want to, again, harken back to Jess. The role of peer specialist is not a treatment practitioner. Um, it really is about being a recovery broker and, um, and really offering the experience of recovery within these settings. And to also reinforce the other point she made, which is you have to work within a culture that recognizes your role. So next slide. So, and the other reason we do this, right, is that there are great outcomes. And so I've just summarized a few here. We could have whole days and dissertations now on the outcomes of peer support work. Um, I've just offered some brief citations here. I think most of us so strongly believe in it. I'm not going to hit the high spots, but just notice down in the citations, um, my funny little comment and more. Uh, because there are multiple, multiple studies and citations now about the benefit of peer support services when delivered the right way uh, as recovery agent um, services delivered by those peer practitioners. Next slide. So then here's the big thing, right? So recovery matters. So that's really the other driver. So for all of these scenarios where we might be doing the someone to talk to or the somewhere to go or the someone to go, 
recovery matters in all of those situations because we have the opportunity in those moments to really work on infusing hope in all of those interventions. So where we can um, and, and can have the voices of lived experience and the skill set brought by those um, trained practitioners, it's very important to infuse the concept of hope to show that recovery is possible and to be sure that folks are really um, able to kind of embrace a path towards some wellness and stability. Next slide. So just wanna give you a quick snapshot of Georgia's emerging crisis system, because I think this is crucial. Um, so at the top bar, uh, the top gray, you see um, gray rows, we kind of have different parts of the system. So a formal crisis response system, this is where we're working really hard on, on what is in the legislation that we're all uh, coalesced here for today. Um, the someone to talk to, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. So in Georgia, uh, that's of course in the green, the Georgia Crisis and Access Line, which has been referenced here many times. It's 24-7. It serves as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline here in Georgia, um, like single statewide call center that's been in place since 2006. The someone to respond, we do have statewide mobile crisis teams in Georgia, over 159 counties, uh, two vendors who manage and implement that um, response network. And they provide 24 seven community-based rapid response to individuals. They are hooked to GCAL for dispatch and deployment, as well as for follow-up so that we have kind of the closure of the loop um, for information for the system. And then we have a network of crisis stabilization units um, which are 24-7 stabilization services, um, generally with a length of stay around seven days. We have behavioral health crisis centers, which are attached to some of those, not all of those, but which are crisis walk-in centers and temporary observation capacity. They function as outpatient, so they're not, you're not uh, staying overnight necessarily um, in terms of an admission, but it's really an outpatient walk-in model. We have some detox capacity and then some inpatient psychiatric beds, um, either state run or through contracts for stabilization and referral. The next part of this is we have formal recovery crisis supports. So under the someone to talk to, warm lines for substance use and for mental health that peers run and minister and are overseen by our lived experience nonprofit agencies um, in the state of Georgia. And then moving over to the somewhere to go, we have a handful of pure wellness respite centers, which can do day drop in or can do overnight uh, wellness and respite stays. If an individual has um, kind of pre-registered and wants to use that for some peer supported crisis stabilization, and then, of course, we have recovery community organizations sprinkled throughout the community. And then um, we have an outpatient system. And this, to me, is really important because it's about early intervention and prevention, as well as postvention for um, individuals who are coming out of crisis. So this has got to be a crucial part of the system where peers are um, thoroughly embedded. So in Georgia, there's someone to talk to. Um, we have expectations and standards about our community behavioral health centers. We have a couple of emerging CCBHCs, but in Georgia, that's two. And again, we have 159 counties, so that's not our answer yet. Um, so clearly that work though is important. They should respond to some crises for individuals for whom they really know well and work with daily. Same thing in the um, someone to go, but particularly we have also a body of ACT supports, community support teams, um, and intensive family intervention teams for children. And the somewhere to go, again, uh, the basic community behavioral health models and peer support agencies and providers. So next slide. So here's kind of that outpatient crux though, I want folks to just see 
is we employ and enable peer specialists to do a whole body of very specific peer services. So everything, every little box you see here is a peer-driven, peer-centric service. So you see we have youth peer support and parent peer support and whole health and wellness. We have peer program models. We have peer warm lines. Down at the bottom, all those are statewide in the blue oval. Down at the bottom, we have some really specialized peer support initiatives where we're testing and learning new, new ways of delivering peer-oriented services. All of this is part of our outpatient community services, which again should be kind of working towards being sure that folks understand how to manage their behavioral health concerns on a day-to-day -day basis with a recovery mindset really anchored and steeped in, in hope and wellness so that then again, we're preventing and doing early intervention related to crisis as well as follow-up. Next slide. And then here are the other services uh, in the green circle, the box. These are all of the other outpatient services where we allow certified peer specialists to practice in Georgia. So it is a huge body of allowance that we enable in Georgia so that we have the recovery and peer impact across multiple parts of our system. Next slide. And Wendy, can you make a quick comment on the, uh, if we can go back just to the Medicaid covered, non-Medicaid covered, I love the yeah. color scheme that you have here showing how you've built this out. Yeah, so um, on both of these slides, for anybody who referenced it later, since we didn't dive in, there's some things that are just really not conducive to Medicaid. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I've been doing Medicaid financing for 21 years, so um, I, I'm pretty good at this and know, understand there's just some things that don't comport with Medicaid regs, so we just make them non-Medicaid, but most that Georgia does, um, because I'm interested in peer support as part of a Medicaid plan, we've enabled uh, Medicaid billing for the majority of this body of work, so I, I think that covers it, David. Great. Next slide. So um, I think it's just important, again, Georgia, we've been here doing this for a while, <laughs> but I think it's important to understand how we support the peer workforce. Um, we really do a lot of comprehensive efforts. We do pre-academies, we do a lot of recruitment work. We have a ton of body of policy. We've done a lot of work on role definition and we do it over and over and over again. <laughs> um, almost every conference we throw, almost you know, every couple of years, new papers about it to reinforce it. Um, we build financing and reimbursement. The training protocol for the certifying of peer specialists in Georgia, um, ongoing training, ongoing supervision training, so that then again, supervisors understand the role, context, and, and lanes uh, for peer support and, and the sweet spot of their practice. We do even soft skills training for like youth peer specialists who may not have ever had a job before. We work with Voc Rehab to do soft skills training. We have continuing education investment and expectations. And then of course, we have crisis-centered supports where we are talking about um, individuals who work in crisis specifically, kind of how to help that um, along. And that's kind of, I think, a, what a lot of us are going to need to be developing as more peer specialists kind of work in this specific realm of crisis intervention. Oh, somebody said, hat tip to Larry Frick. Yes, my partner and friend uh, who built this uh, along with me. So, um, yeah, uh, what a great thing when, uh, when you have such a great uh, creative mind. It was like, let's do peer support. And then to get to go and, and negotiate that uh, with Medicaid um, as his partner. So that was fabulous. Next slide. So here's just a way uh, in Georgia, we're thinking a little bit about what I call like a tapestry. Um, so of course you see the, the, the three rows, which are still the someone to call, somewhere to go, someone to go. Uh, but these are some main things we're thinking about. And I just really wanted to point out that um, recovery needs to be infused across all three of these things. Um, a competent workforce, including peers, has to be infused across all of these things. And even I think about the cultural and linguistic competence and equity focus, I think really peers are a great uh, modality for reinforcing that. Next slide. 
uh, and go ahead and click again, Ren. So I want folks to see though, what's really important here for Georgia. And I think we all should be thinking about for public sector, I'm speaking about the Public Behavioral Health Authority and how we need to weave in the body of work we're talking about from recent legislation. So call centers, plus all this other crisis infrastructure, the recovery community work, as well as the outpatient work. And so that, that coil is very important in this framework. And then finally, next slide. But we got to speak to this part. And Paul alluded to it earlier. Uh, there is a whole body of coverage outside of the behavioral health authorities. There are Medicaid managed care plans, Medicare, and private insurance plans. So, Medicaid managed care plans, just quick commentary, um, they generally are charged with covering the same thing as an estate benefit plan for Medicaid, but their understanding and depth of allowance on peer support is, uh, it, it, it varies widely. How's that for the nicest way I can say it? It varies widely across the country how that is interpreted, managed, and uh, purveyed into communities. Medicare, we know working, Nashville has been doing tons of work along with um, other national associations and trying to crack this. I've been called to DC to have a conversation about it. We need to keep lifting that up. And then we have a handful, small handful of private insurance plans who've begun to recognize the peer workforce, but it's in very tiny ways. So we've got miles to go on that. So then uh, the next slide is just my tag. So with that, David, I'm gonna hush and turn it yeah. on over. My, uh, I think somebody, somebody did ask about how many peers are certified in Georgia. Yeah, Mike Georgia. was asking about that. Yeah, so it's 3,000 plus right now. Terrific, Wendy, terrific. Uh, and that's certainly one of the, the nation's leaders in, in, in that space. And Wendy, that miles to go uh, is a lot easier given the groundwork that you've done with Medicaid that can be lather, rinsed, and repeated across these other resources as parity comes into play. So let's get a couple of comments from our round table. If we can go to the next slide, uh, Ren, uh, Lisa St. George, uh, are you with us to reflect on this rich discussion of peer supports today? Yeah, yeah. It was so great to hear about uh, Georgia's workforce. Of course, we've all been watching it since the start. It's been so important. And, you know, what I can say is that Arizona also looked at at Georgia and has, has uh, been able to put together a fairly large workforce itself in some of the same ways that Georgia did. And you know one of those key components that we heard again and again was the Medicaid billing for peer support because that can help it to sustain itself. But as you saw in Georgia um, and, and as we see in Arizona and in other places, peer support needs to be in the total continuum. So that everywhere a person is in our service system, they will have access to a peer support should they choose that. And it's really important, but I also wanna mention that it's also important for other, part uh, other providers in our systems of care to start coming over to that kind of peer support pr perspective. And we, we call that fusion at RI. And so that we are all looking from that hopeful pr perspective that peer support brings, that we all are, working from those from that depth of kindness in our hearts when we're working with people and I know that that we all give a lot but it's really important that people get hope and positive uh, belief in them uh, from every member of every uh, behavioral health support team member so um, thank you so much Wendy for that great presentation. Thank you Lisa. Tanja Miles are you with us to give a quick comment? Yes, sir. I'm just excited. Wendy is amazing. And I'm just so glad that Georgia is leading the charge when it comes to making sure peers are respected. And a lot of us would do this work for free, but a labor's worth of it's higher. So the fact that, you know, negotiating with Medicaid and other, you know, funding streams is just a game changer. Uh, again, I'll go back to just the respect of knowing that peer support specialists, we do amazing work. And uh, we do have uh, passions and desires just like everybody else. And to, this will not just be us being seen as a glorified um, 
a person who's just in recovery, but now a part of a workforce, a career. So we get to make a career out of something that we're passionate and called to do. It's just a win-win. So thank you so much, Wendy. And um, again, I'm so excited that you guys have this framework and states like Louisiana and others can follow what you guys have done um, uh, to, because we're not just glorified sponsors. We're actually, you know, a part of a team that's caring and compassion about recovery, like you said, recovery matters. So thank you. I'm excited about this. Great. Thank you, Tanja. Richard McKeon, any final reflections uh, on this uh, discussion today? Well, I, I think it's been a great, uh, it's been a great discussion. And um, I particularly noted early in the call, um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the comment uh, that, you um, uh, perhaps more guidance from SAMHSA might be helpful um, in, in some areas that uh, some of the guidance that we have is good as it may be a bit general. So that's something our team can certainly take back and, and take a look at to see what, what else we may be able to do to um, assist, you know, particularly in this area of the use of peers as part of the crisis, uh, you know, workforce. Um, you know, as we move toward full implementation of 988. Terrific. And uh, Wendy, uh, thanks again for your presentation. Terrific material, as well as the matrix that you included, that cross-cutting reminded me of uh, 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 Charlie Curry's uh, famous uh, Samsung matrix that was out there for many years. Uh, uh, certainly something we'll be uploading to talk.crisisnow.com. And uh, lots of questions of the workforce per state. Jessica Wolf at Yale has done some great work on this. I'll try to get a link out to that to all of you uh, to supplement the information that Wendy gave us. Uh, and a couple of other states have jumped into the chat text. Uh, next week, we're hoping uh, Dia Gaynor from the National Association of State EMS offices. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the coordination. Uh, there was even some chat text about some of the pushback from uh, 911s, et cetera. So uh, the uh, constant coordination and discussion, uh, John Draper and I were on a call with Dia uh, recently, and I'm hoping that she'll be able to join us this coming week. So again, let us know if you're a state that would like to do a call out on the legislation. And again, keep it coming in terms of feedback and uh, featured presenters and speakers. Th uh, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, everyone who took part today and hope to see you next week. Take care.